you mentioned joint pain um, uh, earlier on. So is joint pain uh, an inflammatory state? And if it is so, then um, how do we prevent it or how do we reverse it? Because I think one of the other areas that you're passionate about is inflammation, reducing inflammation. So um, I remember, in fact, one of your videos where you point out people's noses, inflamed noses tend to be larger and wider and generally sort of more reddish in color. So, but first of all, what is inflammation? Yeah, so inflammation is a state uh, in which uh, the body has uh, an inflammatory response. So it happens a couple ways. One, uh, inflammatory molecules such as cytokines, adipokines, interleukin-6, uh, these molecules that are associated with um, uh, an inflammatory response get mediated. So oftentimes it's actually an endogenous uh, inward biological response our body initiates from some kind of an assault. So it has a purpose generally to help open up the bloodstream uh, vasodilatory effects of these inflammatory molecules will allow for you know swollen blood vessels so uh, more blood can get in there and with more blood it's sort of like you know tunnels for the army to come in so if you increase the blood flow to an area where there's disease the body can help um, mediate and uh, a response uh, to a particular disease so you'll get inflammation where there's infection you will get inflammation where there's an injury where tissue has been harmed, uh, you get this inflammatory response. And so it has a beneficial effect, but too much of anything is a bad thing. So if you have this inflammatory state too often, uh, then you end up causing more harm than good. I mean, your body has capacity uh, for uh, tolerating this. So for instance, hormesis, uh, which I mentioned before, is a, um, process by which the body is um, exposed to something that's injurious, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. But ideally, you want these to be brief and intense. So for instance, <clears throat> when you lift weights, if you lift weights um, briefly, intensely, you destroy tissue. I mean, it's just part of what happens. You get an injurious an injury state, and then your body recovers from it. But when the process is is very intense, so there's a lot of injury, but very brief, then you get the best results. If you do this too much and too often, you don't get as much of a return on your investment and you can actually become more problematic for it. So there is a, a nonlinear shape to uh, hormesis. You want enough, but not too much. Uh, too much is problematic. So <clears throat> one, uh, Another interesting example of this is radiation hermesis. So um, if you Google radiation hermesis, there is some benefit to being exposed to radiation where um, you, you see some benefit, but too much of it, then you get disease such as cancer and radiation uh, sickness and illness. So there are many different forms of hermesis. And also another one would be a talk, uh, sorry, uh, fasting. So you want to fast to the point that you cause some harm, but not too much, and uh, also heat. So you want to you want to go into <clears throat> excuse me a sauna and be exposed to dry finished heat, and then have a, a response to it. But if you're in the sauna for too long um, and the heat for too long, you can denature your proteins, and you you can in fact uh, induce a seizure where you know the body gets too hot. These proteins start denaturing. Uh, usually it's about 106, uh, 105 to 107 degrees, maybe 108. Um, and people, um, and when their core body temperature gets that hot, they'll have a seizure, they'll have brain damage, and they may suffer permanent you know, disability, which you won't recover from. Uh, and you may in fact die. So you, you want to find that sweet spot for this horm hormetic um, stress hormesis experience where you just get brief episodes and intense things and not longer. So a good example to contrast exercise besides weightlifting is in the realm of movement 
particularly in running. So what I advise my clients to do is don't do distance running, but do um, uh, sprinting. So sprinting is uh, something, and I'll pull up uh, an example of this, which would be, uh, I think, helpful to take a look at. Um, can you see this uh, uh, image behind me? Uh, mm -hmm. Does it show up on, on, your, on your end for your audience? Can you see this, this yes. behind me? Okay, so this is an MRI taken of a 58-year-old guy who's a distance runner. Uh, he was eating um, a low-carbohydrate keto diet, was not eating carbohydrates, and <clears throat> we repeated his MRI, and he had this persistence of visceral fat in here. And this is a repeat MRI. And I was disappointed. I'm like, you should not have that visceral fat. It should be substantially reduced from your your scan that you just had done a month ago. And why do you have it? So as it turned out, he's, I asked him, were you cheating carbohydrates, eating some processed foods or carbohydrates, fruit or something? Uh, were you, uh, are you stressed out? Did you have more stress? Stress will cause visceral fat. This white stuff in here is all the visceral fat. The white stuff out here is subcutaneous fat. So it's not, it's not visceral fat. It doesn't really have a problem. It doesn't cause met an effect on your metabolism, the way visceral fat, which secretes a, a lot of inflammatory molecules that I was talking about and causes this inflammation throughout the body, including joint pain. So this guy uh, didn't have stress. He wasn't drinking alcohol. Is the other thing that causes visceral fat and then poor sleep. So those are my questions that I typically ask the big four. But a fifth one that I ask about is distance, uh, durational exercise, chronic exercise. So if you're doing a lot of uh, chronic exercise, distance running is the chief offender. <clears throat> then we see uh, a visceral fat becomes refractory to elimination, meaning it becomes more difficult and challenging to get rid of visceral fat when you've eliminated processed foods. If you keep running, your body wants to hold on to that visceral fat, probably uh, unknown mechanisms, but we do see that there is uh, some um, affinity for preserving adiposity, fat tissue, when you run. So it's really kind of a ridiculous kind of an exercise that people, a fools there, and I would call it, if you're heavy, to go out and run. I remember being you know, a distance runner myself when I was heavy, that overweight physician drinking the chocolate milk, I was running 75 to 90 minutes a day and not losing my fat. So <clears throat> what uh, what I've uh, since learned is <clears throat> that if you stop running and you sprint, where a sprint is simply running as fast as you can possibly run, <clears throat> then you burn fat at an amazing rate. So much dramatic, uh, dramatically, uh, you, you remove, burn this fat much better than running. So here's an example. This is the best example I have found uh, by MRI and, and imagery. And I could tell you about it, but it's better your visitor, your, your, your viewing audience sees it. So all this visceral fat that this guy had here from running 10 miles a day, five days a week, we got him to stop. And over the next two months, he simply sprinted instead of run. And so he sprinted briefly every day for you know a few times like three to six times he'd do a, a six to ten second sprint so we're talking like maybe 30 to 60 seconds maximum um running but it was sprinting and not jogging and he goes from here to this point so you should be able to see that this guy has eliminated almost all his visceral fat now by just that one change Switching from jogging to sprinting eliminate all his visceral fat. But not only that, his shape changed. So he has kind of a blobby abdomen. Now he's got a six pack. Do you see that nice oval shape? And his muscles grew. So sprinting grew his muscles, got rid of this very bad, even deadly fat, visceral fat inside of him, and made him not only functionally better, but more attractive. So he had a better physique. So sprinting um, is a wonderful form of exercise that you should be doing. It points out the, the, the uh, very brief nature of exercise that I believe 
um, is uh, uh, desirable and very nothing else I can think of will get you more short of breath and as quickly as a sprint. I, I mean, I could go and lift weights for, you know, very, very intensely for 30 seconds uh, or do pull-ups for 30 seconds or, you know, squat for 30 seconds or whatever. And I'm not going to be out of breath. I won't have achieved a oxygen debt. I won't have achieved a, uh, an accumulation of lactate in my muscles as great and as significant as were I to have sprinted. So I share very zealously, strongly for audiences who listen to me to um, adopt a practice, consider adopting a practice of sprinting and because of its uh, incredibly hormetic benefit, better than anything else. And also in studies, we see the molecular response within the body molecules, uh, nothing else produces more lactate, which is this molecule of a combination, a hybrid between lactate and phenylalanine um, as much as Sprinty does. And so they looked at 10 different forms of exercise and uh, second to sprinting in producing lactate was um, resistance training. So lifting weights. So lifting weights is behind sprinting uh, for this beneficial molecule that gets released when we exercise. And at the very bottom of the, lead, the list of the 10 study was running. So running hardly produces any lactate. So you really want to have a hormetic response uh, to your exercise. The very best one to uh, produce beneficial results is going to be uh, sprinting.